God tells the church, search the scriptures. Search the scriptures. <laughs> search the scriptures. In St. John 5 and verse 39. Says what? Search the scriptures. Search the Bible. For in them. In them. Ye think you have eternal thank life. God, you think you have eternal life. And they are they. They are they. Which testify of me. That's what I'm doing this afternoon. That's right. I'm testifying of Jesus. Amen. Letting the world know that I don't believe nothing. Nothing. But what is written. In the scriptures, when you stick to the scriptures, these fake preachers could not duke you with artificial prophecy That's and right. fake healing meetings. But the prophet, look at here. Now in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18 and we're at verse 20. Follow me in your Bible. In we're working on how do you know God is dealing with you That's right. versus the devil. That's right. Uh -huh. In Deuteronomy chapter 18 and at verse 20. Yes. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak. Wait a minute. Amen. The prophet which presumed to speak a word. In my name. Which means he took matters in his own hands. That's right. That's and right. you have a lot of people sitting in churches mm -hmm. because some reject, one of the devil's rejects. <laughs> Amen. Told them, oh, God spoke to me and made me a preacher. Yeah. Made me a preacher. I heard all type of callings from these devils that pose as preacher. I heard a man tell me, you know, when you're a child, things make certain noises to you. Mm -hmm. Like a windshield wipers on a car. Mm -hmm. You listen at it long enough when you're a child, you think you're saying something. Go away, go away, go away. Mm -hmm. Listen at things bumping around in the dryer. That's right. Amen. One fella told me that he heard a preacher said, when the Lord appeared unto him, the Lord looked like an astronaut. That's the devil. That's the devil. Huh? That's oh. the devil. <laughs> That's right. huh? God Almighty in a space suit. That's no. truly the truly, devil truly from the devil. depths of hell. That's right. What in the world do people think God is? <laughs> an astronaut. He's related to Neil Armstrong now. My Lord. And people play with God, but what makes it so sad, churches are packed mm -hmm. around the world, some of them. And then you have some that just have a scattered few. But if a person is just one follower of the preacher, yeah. that's one too many. That's right. And uh -huh. what he said? But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, yeah. which I have not commanded him to speak. I didn't. Wait a minute. I have not commanded him to speak. If the Bible says flesh mm -hmm. and blood yeah. cannot mm -hmm. inherit yeah. the kingdom of God, and then someone say, I got a revelation that flesh and blood went in there one time. God didn't make them speak that. No. And that's the fellow that took it upon himself. That's right. If the Bible says plainly, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Mm -hmm. And somebody come along and said, I got a revelation mm -hmm. that there's two up there. Yeah. God didn't make them speak that. No. In other words, God don't make nobody speak nothing that contradicts the book. If the Bible says God, mm -hmm. not man. God have set some in the church first Apostle. apostles. Amen. And somebody come along and say they got a revelation mm -hmm. that Paul was the last one right. and there are no more apostles now. God didn't make you speak that. No. Now do you see what I'm talking? Amen. Do you hear the Bible saying here? But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word the in prophet, my name. I want to lock you down with lock, Bible. That's right. Lock you down until you bang on the door and can't get out because <laughs> the Bible got you had locked in his word. That's right. Eh? But the prophet, the messenger, which I presume to speak presume a word in my name, to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak. I did not authorize him to say it. Or that he shall speak in the name of other gods. He shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. Amen. That, that prophet shall what? That prophet shall die. Like Minister Etheridge open remarks. Mm -hmm. He said, Pastor Jennings is going to preach to you the God of the Bible. Right. Not the God of theology. That's right. Not the God of history. That's right. Not the God of opinion. Mm -hmm. The God of the Bible. Right. Jehovah. Yeah. I am that I am. That's right. Christ, mm -hmm. the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. Not multi gods, one God. That's right. And, and if thou say in thine heart, if thou if you say in your heart, how shall we know? Uh oh. Amen. I want everybody. Blessed be the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I will give chapter and verse for this. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, now we're at verse 21. This is so beautifully outlined. And if thou say in thine heart, you that are watching, mm -hmm. 
Mm. And you that are here, Amen. if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? How will I know the word, the word which the Lord, that the Lord has not spoken, did not say when a prophet, when a messenger speaketh in the name of the Lord, even if he used the Lord's name when he's speaking, if the thing follow not, if the thing mm -hmm. don't follow, nor come to pass, nor come to pass, that is now the hold thing. it. Mm -hmm. What do that thing got to follow? The scriptures. Scriptures. Oh, that God that got to follow scripture. That's right. And then it don't come to pass. Nor come to pass. And that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. The Lord didn't speak that. But the prophet had spoken it presumptuously. He did it on his own. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. What? Thou shalt not be afraid of him. I don't care if you listen to his broadcast. He can scream and yell until he give you a haircut from his breath. <laughs> it just snatched the hair out your roots. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. <laughs> He yells so loud, your clothes shrink. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Amen. That fella's about six feet five, and he listened to the preacher, and the preacher yelled so much until when the fella left, his sleeves of his jacket was up to his elbows. <laughs> that Amen. don't matter. No. That don't matter. The holy word said, Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Don't pay him no mind. Like Wh these mm -hmm. devils that said the Lord spoke to them, it's time for them to get a new jet. They yeah. get a new car That's and right. all this materialistic trash. That's Why right. don't the Lord tell you to repent and be <laughs> baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Amen. Why you don't? Why that voice that talked to you don't tell you to go to the altar and receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongue? That's right. Why that voice that you hear talking to you don't tell you get rid of your second wife yeah. or your second husband? Amen. You no good misfit no good. for preachers. That's right. What he said? When a prophet, glory to God, when a, when prophet, a prophet speaketh in the name. Of the Lord. Speak in the name of the Lord. If the thing follow not, thing don't follow, nor come to pass, don't come to pass. That is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. God ain't said that. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. He did it on his own. Thou shalt not be afraid. Don't of pay him. him no mind. That's right. Huh? That's right. All right, let's go back to where you were. Now let's get the first chapter of the book of Romans. Now in Romans chapter one, and we'll start reading at verse twenty. I want to show you to be able to identify. Mm -hmm. When God did it. That's now, right. this is the danger of a false prophet. Because a, pro a false prophet knew how to use the scriptures too. Yeah. Remember, when Jesus was fasting 40 days and 40 nights, mm -hmm. the tempter, Jesus and him was up in the wilderness. Yeah. Being led, and he jumped on Jesus. He jumped on him. And you bear in mind, he quotes scriptures to him. That's right. Now, quoting scriptures is good. So before you get excited and someone say, well, Pastor Jennings, she brought Bible. Pastor mm. Jennings, he brought Bible. Yeah. This is the mistake that the ignorant makes. Mm -hmm. You can bring Bible, but the question is, what is your motive? That's right. What is your intent? That's right. Because these preachers that preach prosperity, they bring scripture that talks about money. That's right. Don't they do it? Amen. They bring scripture that says money answer for all things in it. And they got you thinking that the more you give, the more money you give, that determines what God do for you. No, it don't. No. Your blessing don't hang on dollars and cents. That's right. Your blessings hang on your obedience to God. That's right. Huh? Amen. That's what it hangs. Amen. Amen. Why? Why? Well, how can you say that, Pastor Jennings? Jesus taught us the poor you have what you always. Always. Suppose a man or a woman ain't got no money to give God. That's right. Are you going to say that they are outside of the blessings of God? Mm. The greatest offering you can give God is not a dollar. Mm. The greatest offering you give God is yourself. That's right. The Bible said present your body Bodies. as living. a living, hallelujah, living. sacrifice, holy. holy. Glory to God, Holy. acceptable one to God which is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. So if you want to give God something you don't have no money, give God your eyes. Mm -hmm. Give God your ears. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Give God your mouth. That's right. Give God your whole body. That's right. And repent. Hallelujah. Or take God and be baptized in water. That's right. In the name of Jesus Christ. When mm -hmm. you give God that, 
That's bigger than any bigger. dollar sign under the sun. That's right. Come on, son. Romans chapter 1, and we're at verse 18. All right. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The wrath of heaven God is revealed from heaven. Against up. all against ungodliness. All the ungodliness. And unrighteousness of men. Who do what? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Men hold the truth. How? In unrighteousness. I told you. Amen. Amen. There are some men that have knowledge yeah. of certain truths in scripture. That's right. But how do they hold it? Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Not even, they don't even have the Holy Ghost themselves. Right. How do they hold it? Hold the truth in unrighteousness. They haven't even repented of their sins and been baptized the right way in the name of Jesus Christ themselves. Yeah. And yet they read from the scriptures of truth and tell you many truths. Hold but the truth. they are unrighteous. They are ungodly. They are unholy. They are representatives of the devil That's who right. use the truth to deceive and Go trick ahead. the simple. That's right. Hold the truth. They do what? Hold the truth. They do what? Hold the truth. They hold the Bible. How? In unrighteousness. And yet they're not right. That's right. Amen. Amen. Hold it. They hold the Bible, how? In unrighteousness. Amen. And then the people say, oh, my preacher preached from the Bible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do the devil. <laughs> That's right. That's huh? right. That's right. So do the devil. You ain't got the devil beat. No, no. Anytime the devil, the devil was quoting them scriptures at Jesus, mm -hmm. it was a war of it quotation. War. Yes, it was. Huh? That's right. It was a what? You better hold that mm -hmm. and go to the book of Matthew quick. Now in the book Let's of Saint Matthew. Let's look at this confrontation between Jesus and the devil. Matthew chapter 4. And they four. both were battling using scripture. That's right. All right, son. Matthew. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Saint Matthew chapter 4. We're starting in verse 1. Uh -huh. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Jesus, that body of flesh and blood was yeah. led up by the spirit of God that was in it. Mm -hmm. Huh? See, he was led by led. the Spirit. Uh -huh. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. He was afterward and hungry. Yes. And when the tempter came to when him. When the devil came to him. He said, if thou be the Son of God. If you be God's Son. Command that these stones be made bread. Notice, the devil come at him when he, is at his when he was physically weak. That's right. What you mean physically weak? Yeah, yeah, listen, you go a long term without eating mm -hmm. and without drinking, brother. You're in, you in, you in trouble. Amen. What do you mean? Your body is physically weak. You're hungry. Yeah. Jesus was hungry. Mm -hmm. The spirit wasn't hungry because the spirit don't need to fast. That's that right. body was fasting That's right. and the body was hungry. That's right. Why? Because the body of the Son of Man left an example for the body of Christ, the church. You got the fast mm -hmm. and you will suffer. And while you're fasting and hungry and suffering and offering your body up to God, the devil going to jump on you too. And when the tempter came when to him. When the tempter came to him. He said, if thou be the son of God, be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Yes. But he answered and said, it is written. Now, Jesus responds to the devil. How? It is written. How? It is written. Look at sweet Jesus That's running right. to what's written. That's right. What did Jesus say to the devil? Man shall not live by bread alone. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Let me break that statement down a little further. Yeah. Bread is for the natural body. Mm -hmm. Bread is something carnal. Yeah. So when Jesus said man should not live by bread alone, alone, but by every word that come out of God's mouth, mm -hmm. that lets you know the things of this life won't get you right. That's right. Huh? That's the right. things of this life is for temporary use. Yeah. You need every word, every word that come out of the mouth of God in order to enter into life. That's right. Uh -huh. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. Now, I've heard false prophets say, just throw the Bible on the devil here and back up from you. Don't believe that. <laughs> believe that. Here's Jesus quote Bible and the devil kept bothering him. <laughs> That's right. And the devil ain't go somewhere and hide in a hole. No. Look at here. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. The devil took Jesus up in the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and then what and saith unto him if thou be the son of God he noticed the devil stayed on him yeah the devil rides your back don't he amen he stayed on Jesus that's right if you be the son of God cast thyself down jump, jump, kill yourself for it is written wait a minute amen wait a minute amen Jesus just, just dash just, just dash yourself down mm -hmm. he first let's see where he took him then the devil taketh him up into the holy city. He took him in the holy city. And setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. He put him on the pinnacle, a high point. Right. A high point of the temple. Of the and, and then once he got to the high point 
of the temple, what did the devil suggest to Jesus? And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Jump off. That's right. That's right. Jump off. Cast thyself down. The devil's down. doing the same thing to people now. Yeah. Putting it in your mind and in your heart to take your life. That's right. Kill yourself. Amen. You go through so much, you get so depressed and get so down. Yeah. The devil said, there ain't no reason to live. Take your life. Amen. Because the devil even know if you take your life, you lost. That's right. Huh? That's right. You lost, I said. Oh, yeah. What is it? If thou be the son of God. If you be the son of God. Cast thyself down. Why? For it is written. After he suggests to Jesus to kill yourself, kill yourself. look how he brings scripture mm -hmm. to justify what he's saying to Jesus. For it is written. It is written. He shall give his angels oh, charge if you just thee. jump, If you jump off this pinnacle, mm -hmm. it is written, Jesus, how he, God, will give the angels charge concerning, thee. concerning you. And in their hands and they in shall their bear thee up. And they'll catch you. They'll Let, catch you on your way down. Less than any time thou dash thy foot yeah, against yeah, a stone. They'll catch you. But so your feet don't even hit the stones. That's right. Uh -huh. Jesus said unto him. Now here come Jesus. It is written again. You see how they're going back and forth? That's right. The devil says it's written. The Jesus said it's written. It is written. But the point is mm -hmm. motive of usage of scripture. That's right. Satan used the scripture to try to trick Jesus. Yeah. Jesus used the scripture to correct Satan. That's right. Do you get me? That's right. The false prophets use scripture to destroy you. Mm -hmm. Here we come along with the scriptures to correct you. Amen. Amen. False prophet use the scripture to trick you so trick you can you. be lost. We come along with the scriptures to undo what every false prophet done to put you on a straight path That's and right. give you a chance to be saved. That's right. Uh -huh. Jesus said unto him. Jesus said to him. It is written again. It's written again. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So I want to say, wait a minute, Pastor Jennings. Wait a minute, Pastor Jennings. <laughs> Amen. So was Satan tempting God? No. No. Satan was tempting that body that God was in. That's right. Huh? That's right. Because God cannot be tempted with evil. With evil. All right, son, read on. Again. Again. The devil taketh him up into an minute. exceeding he's, high mountain. He's still not finished? Again. How many here want the devil to leave them alone? Raise your hand. Everybody may as well put, may as well put both your hands up. Huh? Right. You want the devil to leave you alone, don't you, Will? Oh, yes. Yes, I Amen. know. <laughs> I want the devil to leave me alone. Amen. Some folks say, but why don't you pass it? I never say what Jesus said. Say it and get behind me. Right. Someone say, you don't say that? No. No. The only, listen, I want to give you knowledge, Detroit and the world. Mm -hmm. I want to give you knowledge. Mm -hmm. No one in the Bible ever told Satan to get behind them but Jesus. But Jesus. <clears throat> if you read the Bible, not even the apostles no. told the devil, get behind them. No. You know why Jesus was the only one that said that? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus being God, he was the only one to tell the devil, get behind me. What you mean? Get in your place. That's right. That's right. You can't be ahead of me. That's right. I'm the first. I'm the last. I give the orders. That's right. Hallelujah. That lets you know even the devil is subject, subject to God. That's right. Don't you remember when Jesus came to the man possessed of the devil's name, Legion? Mm -hmm. And when the Legion got to talking, the Jesus said, hold thine hold peace, peace and come out of him. That's right. Before the devil came out, the devil asked Jesus, can we go in the swine? swine? Then the Bible says, Jesus gave them leave, gave them leave. meaning Jesus let them go. That's right. That lets you know not even they can go where they want to go without God's permission. Amen. And when God gave them leave, they went on to the swine. That's right. That goes to show you even that devil is subject to God. Amen. Eh? Amen. All right, son. Again, the devil taketh him up to an exceeding high mountain. Blessed be the name of God, the devil come along, take him up to an exceeding high mountain. A mountain, and, and that's what the devil do to people now. Yeah. They get a devil, make them mentally and emotionally exalted. That's right. They exalt themselves, and that's why they say, the Lord is dealing with me to do this. The Lord move on me to do that. Mm -hmm. The Lord spoke to me to do the other. Mm -hmm. Take what a person say that God told him, mm -hmm. 
claim that God told them. Yeah. Take what a person does who claim God told them to do it yeah. and run back to scripture. That's right. Don't get shaky. Don't get nervous. None of that. None of that. None of that. Just be cool. <laughs> don't right. worry. Be happy. That's right. Be cool and go to the Bible. That's it. And when that thing contradicts the Bible, tell them, look, the Bible says such and such a thing. And when they keep saying, well, the, uh, the Lord moved on me. I no, no. The Bible says such and such a thing. Well, wait a minute. The Lord, I felt a moving from God. No, no, no. The <laughs> Bible said such and such a thing. And, and, and then let them start. Hello, Baba. Shut. Hello, Baba. Don't interrupt them. Wait till they're done. And when they're done, hello, Baba. Shut. Mm. Uh, it start wearing off. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and when they straighten up, tell them. The Bible says. That's right. Come on back to Bible. That's right. That's right. I don't believe nothing. Amen. Nothing. Oh. Nothing. Amen. But what's written. That's right. In that book. That's it. If it contradict the book, I'm not moving. No. I don't care if you float until you get stuck in the ceiling. <laughs> and they take the fire department and get you out. Mm -hmm. When they get you out and I visit you at the hospital and you lay in there. Hey, brother, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Pastor Jenny. Come back to Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laying there? Well, you laying hey, there. Hey, ma'am, I'll make that heart monitor go out of control. <laughs> Come on back to Bible. That's, that's right. I'm calling Hallelujah. for the world. This is a universal Bible call. That's right. That's why we're looking at everything under the sun from the lens of Scripture. Go ahead. And then people, and notice what people say. I'm talking about people who claim they saved. Mm -hmm. When you hold the Bible on them, you know what they say? You're in a cult. Yeah, that's right. That's what some folks say about us. Oh, yeah, just a cult. They don't take all that in the Bible. Don't take all that. <laughs> Bible said to believe on Jesus. As the scripture has as said. As the scripture has said. That's it. And I'm going to preach Jesus according mm -hmm. to scripture. To the scripture. We're going to believe on him according to mm -hmm. The scriptures. That's right. Do you hear? Do you hear? Do you hear? Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. The devil take him up to a high mountain. And showeth him all the kingdoms of the world. That's what the devil do to people now. He take you in an exalted place, exalt your mind, exalt your heart. That's until right. now, a spirit is dealing with you so much, you don't believe the Bible. That's right. You mean to tell me all that shaking and all that yelling and dog barking and <laughs> Sounding like a well giving signals underwater until you don't believe the Bible. Huh? That's you right. don't believe the Bible? Don't believe it. Here's the Bible speak plain mm -hmm. how a thing should be done, done, and you're that anointed. Yeah. You're that God is talking to you so much, mm -hmm. and you feel the presence of God so great. Amen. Until you ignore the Bible, My Lord. I want to say to everybody who have said at any time, the Lord moved on you to do anything or the Lord spoke to you to say something. And yet that thing is in violation of the Bible. The devil spoke to you. Right. The devil is moving on you. Did you hear the old troublemaker? That's I'm right. barking Bible. Amen. Bible. You know, sometimes you hear that dog. Roo, 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 roo. That's what I'm doing. Bible, 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 Bible. That's scripture, right. scripture, scripture. I That's want to right. say to everybody under the sun, don't believe nothing no. but the scriptures. That's right. That's right. Huh? That's right. Jesus said, he that believeth on me, as the scripture, as has the said. scripture said. That's right. So I'm going to believe on Jesus mm -hmm. as, as the, the scripture, scripture said. That's right. That's right. And then rightly divide it. Yeah. And take it apart. Amen. Glory to God. What did he say? Again, the devil taketh up him up into an exceeding high mountain. And, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world. I want to say to all the ministers of First Church. You better stay in the Bible. That's right. All the ministers in America, Canada, South America, Europe, Asiatic world, all through Africa, India. You better stay in the Bible. I don't care if the ink get on your skin. Amen. Stay in the Bible. That's right. Huh? That's if right. members get mad at you, stay in the Bible. Amen. If members walk out, you stay in the Bible. That's right. If your wife leave you, stay in the Bible. Amen. If you lose your job, stay in the Bible. That's right. Hey, That's right. Stay there. Amen. Don't let nothing in. Nobody. Hallelujah. 
Glory yeah. be to God on high. Pull you out the Bible. That's right. It ain't nobody under the sun yeah. that's going to move me out the Bible the size Wonderful. of a gnat smallest eyelash <laughs> in his right eye. That's I'm going right. to stay right in the Bible. That's right. Amen. And, I, and the folks say, he's in a cult. He's in the car. The women sit on one side and the men on the other. What you worrying about it for? You ain't in here. That's right. Huh? That's right. Hey, well, why are you complaining? You're not in here. Why are you complaining? Right. Hey, man, the women don't have no problems with it. The men don't have no problem with it. I right. mean, a woman ain't got to be up under her husband to be saved. No. And the husband ain't got to be locked up under his wife to be saved. That's right. The Bible says save yourself. That's right. Huh? Amen. Hey, man, save yourself. That's right. We got, hallelujah. Glory to God. We have a good Bible gospel here. Amen. This is old fashioned, strict, disciplined holiness that the flesh of the human family is not ready to comply with. Amen. For you to comply with Amen. this, you have to be ready to escape hell. That's right. You got to be ready to escape hell. That's right. Otherwise, in that, you stay in your church and you and your church are burning hell forever. Amen. What did he say? Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain. And what? And showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and, and the glory of them. Yeah. And saith unto him, all these things will I give thee. What? All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Do you hear this? Amen. How in the world are you going to promise Jesus something? He owns everything. That's right. That's right. All this will I give you. Wait a minute, Jesus. Jesus already owns everything. That's right. The earth is the Lord's. Amen. Thanks be unto God in the fullness thereof. Mm -hmm. The devil says to Jesus, All these things will I give thee. Yes. If thou wilt fall down and worship me. You want to know what? The devil have made that offer. To many people mm -hmm. now, and they accepted it. Yeah. Look at the entertainer industry. They yeah. accepted that. Oh, yeah. Look at the movie stars, the actors and actresses. They accepted that. Mm -hmm. Look at the mega devils with the mega churches who don't preach against no sin whatsoever. That's right. They accepted that. That's right. They accept money over scripture. Yeah. They accept fame over scripture. Oh, yeah. They accept popularity and notoriety over scripture. Mm -hmm. They accept the crowd over scripture. We won't accept nothing and nobody over scripture. Did you hear what I said? That's right. I, mean, I didn't stutter. I said we won't accept nothing and nobody. Amen. Over scripture, and believe me, I've been offered millions of dollars. Yeah. Since I've been Pastor Jennings, I've been offered millions of dollars. I've been offered organizations. I've been offered mansions. Mm. I've been offered Bentleys. I've been offered Rolls Royces. Amen. I've been offered big bank accounts, and always with a string attached. Yeah. If I bargain or compromise or denounce something that yeah. the Bible stands for. This little materialistic trash you offered me ain't nothing compared to what God offered the church. That's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because, Hallelujah. Hallelujah, because I understand that what you offer me has no value, That's right. what can you offer me compared to New Jerusalem? That's right. Huh? Hallelujah. Jesus Hallelujah. say, Hallelujah. I go away from here. Glory to God that where I am. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You may be also. That's right. John said, I saw New Jerusalem come down. Hallelujah. From God out of heaven. Hallelujah. And God prepared as a bride a dawn for her husband. Wonderful. The city lieth four square. Hallelujah. And the length and the breadth and the height thereof is equal. That's right. Thank God. One part of the city. 144 cubits, yeah. another part, 12,000 furlongs. That's right. Amen. That, that's Hallelujah. what we're laboring for. That's right. I don't care nothing about your matching, your cars. Hallelujah. Preachers have came and offered me their organizations Wonderful. and Hallelujah. offered me their movements. That's if right. I would just bargain and compromise and back up off that's the right. doctrine of the apostles, I said, oh, no. Oh. God made us a builder. That's right. Huh? That's the right. Bible said, except the Lord. Build the house. Build the house. Labor in vain. Glory to God. Labor, hallelujah. In vain. Thank God in vain. That building. I don't need your church. Hallelujah. I don't need your organization. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. To God. When you have God, hallelujah. He'll give you what you need. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. Look, look how God just moved 
with the truth of God. Go ahead, man. City to city. That's right. City to city. That's right. Bringing people in who never met each other Amen. of all the races. Amen. Amen. Come together. I, I think of one man who passed away now mm -hmm. in Martinville, Virginia. Hallelujah. Amen. We didn't have no money mm -hmm. to put a church in Martinsville. Amen. He took cash out of his pocket and bought it. Yeah. Why them bought a church cash? Wonderful. Huh? Amen. Amen. But we won't, if you got the bow, compromise, bargain, yeah. or just ease to the left yes. from scripture, yeah. then what you got ain't worth having. That's right. That's right. Are you getting me? Amen. God first. Amen. Nothing else matters. That's right. Wonderful. Man. Amen. And you, ahead, don't, go you go don't you don't find no religious program that's teaching the people God first. No. You don't find it on television, radio, social media. None of them no. are telling you God first. That's right. Except the Lord. Thank the Lord. Ahead, build the ahead. house. They labor, they labor in vain. That building. Except the Lord keep the city. That's right. And God is keeping the truth of God. Oh, yes. That's why he give us victory from city to city. That's right. Country to country. Mm -hmm. State to state, village to village. Amen. To be, you know how good it feels mm -hmm. to be able to go one time. Yeah. And I'm able to tell the difference between God and the devil. The devil ain't sent me nowhere. No. No. Huh? Hey Amen. The devil ain't sending me nowhere. <laughs> That's right. Nowhere. It ain't a, when, when I That's go in a city brother. or state, I'm not charged by the devil. No. Oh, no. No. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Not at all. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. God said, Go ye. Go ye. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And when he told his apostles, ahead, that included me. You That's know. right. That's right. Go ye! Oh, in the whole world. Preach the gospel. And then he gave me a gift, you know. Go ahead, the man. The Bible says your gift will make room for you. Hallelujah. Glory hallelujah. to God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. And look at the gift that God hallelujah. made for the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Amen. How souls come into the body. Hallelujah. Amen. Way in the old country. That's right. Amen. We got letters from Damascus. Mm. Huh? When Hallelujah. Paul, amen, was knocked down to go the ahead. earth. Go ahead, man. Huh? Go got ahead. letters from Greece. And when Paul went there and fought with them at Athens. That's right. That same message. Hallelujah. They're coming from the four corners of the earth. Hallelujah. God has proven to me, mm. I don't have to change. I don't have That's to wonderful. bargain. That's wonderful. I don't have to compromise. I don't have to change one Bible standard. That's right. Amen. Not one. That's right. I had an old bishop tell me, it ain't nobody going to follow you with that strict stuff you're teaching. Mm. At the time he told me that, I was about 23. Mm -hmm. He said, when you get older, you will understand. Mm -hmm. You need to turn that, you need to tone that stuff down. Mm. I got older and got worse. That's right. Got worse. That's right. And it shocked people. It shocks people to see the telecast airing from different areas and hear all these people going down in the water. Yeah. It shocks them. Preachers are over the air almost cussing. <laughs> Mad. Because they haven't baptized nobody. That's right. Nobody. One man from PAW, an elder, he came and we was in uh, Monroe, Louisiana, I think, and that first night of service, close to 50 or 60 something souls went down in the water. Mm -hmm. He came to me and said, Pastor Jennings, we ain't baptized two people in 10 years. My Lord, my Lord. People want to know, what is it about Pastor Jennings that got people coming? Nothing. Nothing. It's God. That's right. Not me. It's the Lord. That's right. Hallelujah. There ain't nothing about Pastor Jennings. No, no. I must decrease. That's right. Glory to God, but he that sent me must increase. That's it. Amen. It is not me that's speaking. No. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But it's the voice of my Father. That's it. Speaking thing, and that's why you just got to, come. got to come. You can't beat the Father. That's, that's right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Go ahead, man. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Go God. Ahead. You can't beat the Father. Go ahead. That gangbanger got to come. That's right. That Bigot got to surrender. Oh, yeah. That black act activist, he got to surrender. That's right. You can be a black activist all you want, but oh, I'm going to activate God in you. Amen. 
come. Amen. You just got to come. Got to come. Amen. I don't care who you are, elder, bishop, pastor, mm. junior, apostle, half deacon, be whatever you like. That's right. If you step a half inch in the kingdom of God at all, oh. it is because you comply with Acts 238, right. Acts 24, mm. and Acts 242. That's right. You comply with that. If not, your bridge is going to be ushered in hell. Amen. And Burn throughout it. I don't care how cute you are, miss. If you got more curves than all the street of Detroit, Ooh. glory be to God. But one day, just like the houses many are abandoned in Detroit, your body going to be abandoned of its spirit. That's right. God going to snatch your breath right out your nostrils and your body going to drop like a vacant house. Amen. And you going to be planted in the dust mm. and the rodents and the worms and the weeds going to grow over your gravesite. And one day the voice of God going to blast you the heavens and you coming out that's right you either coming in the first resurrection mm -hmm. or you're coming in the second that have no power amen do you get what the old man is telling you amen what he said and saith unto him all these things, all will, these I give things thee, will i give you if thou wilt fall down and worship me you will never get that out of me no 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 amen thou shalt worship the lord thy god and him only shall him thine only serve. Shall serve we won't even fellowship mm -mm. with a church that don't stand for what the Bible says. That's right. We won't even fellowship with it. That's right. And we're, and we're the most popular holiness preacher in, probably in the world. Probably. We're known for our strictness and our knowledge of scripture. Oh, yeah. And yeah. then you got preachers calling us, asking us to come and preach. And sometimes I, 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 I'm never hasty mm -hmm. because I won't let preachers try to make big offerings in their building off the popularity of the church. That's right. See, I got to use good judgment. That's right. I won't let nobody make a, a money off first church. No, that's right. Amen. Because a lot of preachers don't know this, but you that been writing us to come preach at the church, all right, but I'm telling you, Amen. I'm telling you, that's right. if you don't stand for the doctrine of the apostles, yeah. you won't get an offering out of us. No. I want to say, you will come to our church and don't give us no money? Yeah. Yes, I didn't stutter. That's right. We have done it. That's right. We went to a church and they didn't tell us they believe in women preachers. Hmm. We went to the church and it was so crowded, people standing on the sidewalk. No one else can get in the building. Mm -hmm. We haven't sat down and got the chairs warm <laughs> before the fella in, the, in that false church jumped up mm -hmm. begging for money. Mm -hmm. And then when he gave honor to his bishop, mother so-and-so supposed to have been the apostle. Yeah. Mother so-and-so, supposed to have been an apostle. That's right. So then he passed the offering pan around. Everybody looked at me and I just said, mm -hmm. huh. No one gave nothing. Nothing. He passed the offering plate in the pulpit. All of us ministers passed it to each other. <laughs> One of my ministers forgot. He reached. I said, what you doing? <laughs> He said, I'm about to give something. I said, I'm about to give you something. <laughs> he said, oh, all right. He kept it going. <laughs> the fellow looked at me and looked at the offering pan. He said, Pastor Jennings, none of your people gave money. I said, you didn't ask us to come to give money. I said, you better off just letting me preach because you ain't getting a dime here. That's right. You ain't getting a dime out of us. Amen. You preachers that don't believe Jesus Christ is God, don't believe it's one God, believe you can divorce and remarry. Believe in women preachers. Believe in singing in tongues. Don't believe in apostles now. Believe flesh and blood is in heaven. Believe that there's two and three gods. Believe in the Trinity. And you want me to preach? You won't get a dime out of us. Right. And if I do come, I tell all viewers who's coming there to see me in person, don't give a dime. Don't give a dime. Amen. Amen. We won't give you a penny. Because you won't get any. <laughs> that's right. Nothing. I, someone say that's mean. Call it what you want. Yeah, what the you Bible mean? said don't strengthen the hands of, of what? Of evildoers. And we ain't doing it. Right. We ain't. Do you see why they call us a cult? Because <laughs> we breathe scripture. That's we right. breathe it. We eat it. We <laughs> lay in it. That's right. We're not getting out of man. I'm landing that scripture yes, like are. a pig in slop. Yes, you are. Huh? Amen. Like a pig in slop. If I lay on my right side, I'm in the Old Testament. The Old Testament. If I lay on my right side, I'm getting on the New Testament. That's right. I'm not getting out of there and I don't care who get offended. If you leave, God will bring 300 to replace the one. Yes, he will. 
He have done it. That's right. Some folks got mad and left. One left, 200 came in. That's right. Five left, 600 came in. Amen. That's why I don't worry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Glory to God. It's so beautiful to see how God is in this. And he's in it deep. And he's in it. What did he say? And said unto him, all these things will all I give thee. All these things will I give you. Thou wilt fall down and worship me. Uh -huh. Then says Jesus then unto said him, Jesus unto him, get thee hence, Satan. Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. And what? And him only shalt thou serve. To all my viewers and you that are here, don't get excited and start jerking and shaking when someone says the Lord told him something. That's right. It's false prophets. I remember years ago when I was a kid in a false church, my former minister preached at an apostolic church that was connected with Bible Way Worldwide in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And my cousin was shot close range, so he was paralyzed waist down. And I remember a false prophet got up and prophesied a lie. Took the microphone and jumping around, because you know one thing about false churches, when these false prophets supposed to be prophesying, they get all excited, making all this noise and stomping their feet. And that dumb bishop don't know what's going on. He just said, let the Holy Ghost have his way. Let the Holy Ghost have his way. He told the church, be quiet. be quiet. The Holy Ghost is moving. The Holy Ghost is moving. No, that dipstick got them acting like a fool. That's all. You got a dipstick acting like a fool. That's right. And then all of a sudden, hallelujah, oh, thus saith the Lord, thus yeah. saith the Lord. And that's what that false prophet done. He stood mm -hmm. up and by the way, stomping and shaking with a skin tight double knit suit on and told my aunt, thus saith the Lord, your son is going to walk. Mm -hmm. This week he's going to walk. Lord. And my aunt went off speaking in tongue and jumped up shouting. Mm -hmm. My cousin died paralyzed. My Lord, my Lord. Died paralyzed. Amen. You see, knowledge teaches you to identify that which is of God and that which is not. That's right. Amen. When you don't have knowledge, these false prophets, all, you can see them all over television mm -hmm. or Internet. The Lord told me to tell you, you don't want a great blessing. He don't want a great the Lord said, get in this 500 line. And if you want a great blessing, get in this $1,000 line. And the Lord told me to tell you, he karatis, 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 karatis. If you want one of them great blessings, you got to get in this $5,000 line. And the Lord said, if you get in that line, you will have a mega, 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 mega universal cyclone tornado twister blessing. <laughs> Amen. You bunch of idiots come yes. near acting like you in some spirit, just getting up in line, shaking like you Ned the wino. <laughs> <laughs> getting all in line, you $5,000 sucker. Sucker, that's right. That's right. A five, imagine, $5,000 ahead, mm. and you got 500 people in line. Lord. You know how much money he cleaned up that night? That's right. Not including the $1,000 line. That's right. If he got about 30 people in the thousand dollar line, that's 30 grand. 30 grand. If he got 200 people in the five thousand dollar line, how much is that? 200 times 500,000 times 5,000. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the amount of money? That's a lot of money. He gathered that money up. You still broke. That's right. Still waiting on the Lord to do something. Mm. And here you already in debt. Look how the preachers do it. <laughs> You're in debt, mm. and then they tell you if you give it, you will get out of debt if you get it. Right. We want to do something for God. I don't tell you, oh, the Lord told me. No, I tell you, all right, saints, look, we want to buy a church. This is what I want you to do. Let's come on and cooperate and do it so we can have a church here in Detroit. That's, That's it. it. That's it. That's right. You see Pastor Jennings or Brother Esther walking around. <laughs> if Effort started doing that, you brothers get a butterfly net, hoist them up, and get them out of here. Take his good talk with him. <laughs> Take him out. <laughs> Take him out, I said. Take him out. That's right. I'm not interested in no gimmicks. No, I'm no. interested in the reality of God. Wonderful. Because God. God is real and the devil is real. 
And for real, the people of the human family is being tricked, conned, manipulated, and, and it's constantly going on. For, you would think it would play old by now. It's been going on for years and years and years. Even in Africa, preachers are using special effects to con the people. This one false prophet got a mass crowd in Africa, and his tech men use special effects to make it appear like angels. My Lord. Holograms. Mm. They had holograms appeared in the audience, and all the people thought it was really angels. Folks start freaking out, getting all happy. The man use holograms. My Lord, my Lord. Money can make a sucker out of people. That's right. We use Bible. That's it. That's it. Heaven and earth. That's it. Glory to God going to pass away. Amen. And all this stuff that's going on is going with it. Yeah. So what have you gained to cater to it? Yeah. What have you gained to believe it? Amen. Don't let no man or no woman come telling you the Lord moved on me to do this the Lord moved on me to do that yeah. and what he done contradicts the Bible what she done contradict the Bible tell him the Bible's whole Bible on them that's right I don't care if it's one of the ministers of the first church that's right if they agree with what's done tell them look the word of God said this yeah and let him come tell you well you don't understand the word of God said yeah. this that's right the word of God said this that's right Put Bible on. Put the Bible on. Huh? Amen. Put hold the word of God on. Yeah. Are you listening, church? Amen. What did he say? And back in 1 John 4 and verse 1. What is it? Beloved, believe not every spirit. Huh? Amen. Do what? But try the spirits. That's what I want to teach you. Yeah. That's why we take our time to teach. Yeah. And I thank God again for the good job. And Brother Minister Ethridge is doing a very good job. Yeah. Yes, he is. He's doing a very good job. One thing I can say about him, he's determined mm -hmm. not to detour from the teaching of the apostles. Amen. He's determined to stay right there. And if there's something he don't know, he never had no problem reaching out to us. Right. If there's something he's uncertain on, he's reaching out to us. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 1, 1 and verse 10, verse Now I beseech you, brethren, mm -hmm. by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That ye all speak the same thing. It should not be a different teaching here in Detroit than it is in Philadelphia. No. It should not be a different teaching in Canada than it is in Philadelphia. That's right. It should not be a different teaching in Chicago than it is in Philadelphia. Amen. It should not be a different teaching in New York than it is in Philadelphia. Amen. Everybody got to comply with the same thing. Same thing. Same thing. That you all speak the same thing. And when you speak the same thing, the Bible says what? And that there be no divisions among you. Ain't no new revelation. No. What have been is now. That's right. There won't be no division among you that what? But that ye be perfectly joined together. How well shall we be connected? Perfectly joined together. How well shall we be connected? Perfectly joined together. Where? In the same mind. Where else? And in the same judgment. Blessed be the name of God. Hallelujah. Did you hear this? Hallelujah. So that's how you can tell whether God is dealing with you. Mm -hmm. God do not deal with you in any manner that contradict the scriptures nor do the Holy Ghost behave itself unseemly, meaning God don't make you conduct yourself in a way that contradict his word. That's right. The word of God is a guideline, is a disciplinary book. Yeah. It's the book of discipline that governs us. That's Someone right. said, Pastor Jenny just want to control people. I don't want to control nobody. No. The Bible is the controller. That's right. It is the Bible that tells us what we can do, what we can't do, what, where we can go, where we can't go. The Bible controls the church. Yeah. And the reason why folks don't want holiness is because they don't want no control. <laughs> holiness is like a girdle. Oh, yeah. Huh? Oh, yeah. Brother, now, well, you put that girdle on, brother, that flesh is controlled. <laughs> That's, huh? right. That's right. You know what I'm telling you? Hey, man, you take that girdle off. <laughs> you put that girdle on. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Bible said, gutter up your lawns the Lord, yeah. with the truth. That's right. I mean, we, we, the Bible, they don't want the girdle of the Bible. Oh, no. Amen. This is the tightest girdle in the world. Amen. Because your whole body got to be in it. Amen. You know, a woman put on a girdle, ain't on the whole body. This thing is from your toes to your head. Lord. It's on the inside, on the outside. It cover you head. from head to toe, from mm. mind, heart, soul, body, and spirit. That's right. And that's why we feeble, ungodly things that pose as Christians. Yeah. They don't want holiness. No. Because holiness is the most tightest, 
<laughs> uncomfortable, uncomfortable girdle <laughs> in the world. That's right. They say Pastor Jen is putting people in bondage. I ain't putting you in bondage. No. The Bible did it. Mm. Someone said, but I thought we were free. That's just it. The bondage of God is the freedom of God. That's right. Give me Ephesians chapter 3 mm -hmm. and verse 1. Ephesians. I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you heard. Of the dispensation of the, dispensation of the, grace, of the, grace, of the of grace of God that's given to me for you. It. How, that by revelation, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. And he said, I, Paul, the what? The prisoner. What am I? The prisoner. Of who? Of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus Christ is the warden of the church. That's right. I'm just a correction officer, that's all. Mm -hmm. Williams got my nightstick. Got nightstick. Oh, and I see folk try to get out of your line. Boop, Bible. Yeah. I come along and crack you over the head with the nightstick of the Bible. That's right. When I see the women getting up trying to act like they're preaching, boop, Bible. <laughs> That's right. Huh? When I see the men want to act too timid, boop, Bible. Bible. You get what I'm telling you? Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got to rely, rely on Bible. I don't care if you get upset. I ain't never coming back. Pastor Dillon made me so angry with what he preached. Ooh, ooh, I can't stand it. While you walking out, I'm hitting you on the head with Bible. <laughs> Bible. <laughs> But I ain't coming back, Pastor Jenner. All right, Bible. <laughs> Amen. You're going to thank God for this when you see Jesus. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. Huh? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Many of you that are watching, upset, cussing me out, and mad now, but when you obey this and see Jesus, mm. you're going to be so grateful. Yes, you will. When your body defy the law of gravity, when the voice of God blasts through the universe mm. and you find yourself going up in the first resurrection, mm. all because you obeyed holiness. Mm. Someone said, well, ain't something else can get me there. No, no. The Bible said holiness without, without which no man, no man see shall see the Lord. No, it ain't another religion can say that. No. Pentecostals can't say it, apostolic can't say it, Baptist can't say it, non-denominational can't say it, Mormon can't say it, Muslim can't say it, Jehovah Witness can't say it because the Bible said what it gets you there. Follow peace. Bible says. Follow in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Follow peace. With all men. What did he say? And holiness. Holiness. Without which. Without which. No man. Who? No man. Who? No man. No man shall do what? Shall see the Lord. You ain't holy, you ain't gonna see him. No. You no. ain't gonna reign with him. No. You're going to run around your church, start running at five years old, and don't stop till you're 105. Huh. But if you ain't holy, no man shall see the Lord. You ain't going back with Jesus. No. Preacher, you can jump, skip, yell, scream until you grow up afro and scream till your hair come out and yeah. the afro come back again. <laughs> you ain't holy. You ain't going to see Jesus. No, you won't. You're not going to do it. Nope. You're not going to do it. You ain't going to see it. Jesus in peace. No. Everybody under the sun, everybody. Everybody, everybody in Detroit, you might as well agree to padlock the doors of your churches, preachers and everybody. Yeah. Everybody must repent of your sins and be baptized in water. What you mean repent? You got to be sorry about your wrong. That's right. Sorry about it. Get ready to come out the bar. Stop your dancing. Stop your smoking. Stop your lying. Stop gambling, playing the number, pretending you a Christian. You party all week and then go to church on Sunday thinking you did God a favor. You ain't did God no favor. Amen. You shaking your old hips. A man grinding on the front, a man grinding on the back, and two little men look like elves grinding on the side of you. <laughs> and you in the middle with your hair and somebody else's hair, lips all red, fake fingernails. Go ahead. Hey man, rouge on your face, horse hair for eyelashes, just shaking. Shaking. Am I right, I said? Yeah. Am I right? Go ahead. Man. We come along with the Bible to put you on a straight path. That's right. There's not another gospel one that a son that is like this. That's right. The Holy Ghost said. Men and brethren, what shall we do? The Bible ain't tell you bow your head and raise your hands and accept Christ as your personal savior. No. The Bible didn't tell you to join this church. The Bible didn't tell you pray some cheap sinner's prayer. No. You in some church, the preacher say, I'll open the church doors and give you a home. Mm -hmm. And here you come up holding the hand of some homosexual preacher and a bunch of little elders and they're holding your hand. You repeat a prayer that's not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Wash me white as snow. Cleanse me coming to my heart. And the preacher say, I'm, you're saved, my friend. You say it, then he give you a brown envelope so you can put two dollars in it. That's that lets right. you know how cheap your religion is. <laughs> Amen. 
Holy Ghost didn't say do that. Now, then Peter said unto them, what? Repent. All right, you that claim you save, if you bow your head and raise your hands, you still a sinner. Yeah. Put your hands down and raise your hand. Put your head up and put your hands down. You're not saved. No. You've been duped. You've been conned. You've been bamboozled. You've been led astray. Mm -hmm. You got sprinkled by a priest. When the priest threw water on you, you should have threw it back on him. <laughs> Amen. You're not saved. You're no. still a sinner. Mm -hmm. Well, I go to church every week, so the roaches. Yeah. Yeah? That's right. You don't find a roach saying he saved you. No. <laughs> yeah? No. You want to take care because you go to church every week. <laughs> I'm an usher. Then sit down. <laughs> Stop ushering people to hell. That's you right. got to repent, repent. Mr. and Miss. Mm -hmm. And do what? And be baptized. No, join the church. And be baptized. No, prayer sin is prayer. And be baptized. No, they bishop said baptism is an outward sign of inward grace. No, that's a lie told by an outward devil from, uh, from the devil. Repent and be baptized. How? Every one of you. How much of Detroit? Every one of How you. How much of Detroit? Every one of you. You got this to do. That's now, right. You got this to do. Yeah. Holy Ghost, take the whiskey out your hand. Make you knock the bar down in your house. That's right. Take the Budweiser out your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Get rid of Jack and Daniels. Amen. Run your second wife out the house and your third husband down the street. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Make the young girl who's debating whether to be a virgin or not keep her virginity. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Make the homosexual get rid of his homosexual lifestyle. Yeah. Humble himself and give his life over to God. That's right. Make that fellow who he know God ain't made him a preacher. Make him submit himself and come out the pulpit. Mm -hmm. You got to repent. repent. That's what repentance is. You're godless sorrow for all your wrong. Yeah. And when you repent, you'll be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of to sins. To get your sins washed away, then what? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Ghost is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And you know you have the Holy Spirit when you're speaking another tongue at the Spirit of the living God and give utterance Amen. like they did on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem. That's the new birth. That's the, That's the way you're born again. That's if you right. don't have that, you ain't never been saved since you walked the planet Earth. That's right. Who, Pastor Jen, is who? Everybody. 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 I don't care if you're white as snow, black as the street, brown as cinnamon, yellow as the skull bus, or clear as water. Yeah. Everybody got to do the same thing to get into the kingdom of God. That's Detroit! Right. You that are not baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, you're still a sinner. Yeah. Not only must you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ after you repent, you got to come out of that religion you're in. That's right. You got to leave the false church you're in. Church. The Lord say be holy and you know what you're in ain't holiness. Yeah. Baptist because your mama is a Baptist. <laughs> Baptist because your daddy is the Baptist reverend. That's right. You walk around, I'm non-denominational. You're right. You're nothing. Nothing. You don't find non-denomination in the Bible. What's the matter with you? No. Well, I thought, you thought what? Well, didn't the Bible say John was a Baptist? When the Bible said John the Baptist, it talked about his occupation. John was a baptizer. That's right. John religion wasn't Baptist. No. If it was Baptist, you still in trouble. Because John said, I'm not the light. That's right. I am not the light. That's right. John said, I come to bear witness of the light. Anybody want to get on the right path for once in your life? Hallelujah. Get on the right path and truly get right with God according to what is written in the scriptures, not according to your family tree, not according to your idea, your philosophy, your personal feelings, not according to your theory. That's we right. preach the God of the Bible. That's it. If you want to be right according to the instructions from the God of the Bible, if you want to be baptized the right way in the name of Jesus Christ, stand on your feet, Detroit, if you want it. If you want it, stand on your feet. Glory to God. Wonderful. Stand on your feet, I said. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. All of you that are standing, go right to the back. All of you that are standing, go right to the back. Amen. All of you that are standing, you that are watching, this is the truth of God. Amen. This is the only message you will find on internet or television that's gathering true souls for the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. God is rounding up his people. Hallelujah. Glory to God for, for his coming. Amen. That's why you find people coming by the grove. Look at the numbers just lined up back there. Right. Ready. Ready. The Bible said be ready for every good work. That's right. Amen. The Bible said you'll give and make room for you. 
Amen. And it's making, God has given me room. Oh, yeah. How much room? The world. That's right. And the world. I don't care what city we go to. God has given us the city before we get there. Amen. He give us the city before we get there. Oh, yeah. Why? The city belonged to him. That's what right. did he tell Joshua? Everywhere the soles of your feet shall tread. Right. I give it to you. Amen. Amen. So you preachers that are hollering, I want you to look now. Mm -hmm. I want you to look as the camera showing you their souls. Yeah. Get ready to go down in water. 24 went down last night. Amen. God willing, next year we'll be starting the new Truth of God Temple in Dubai. Wonderful. Next year, God willing. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. Oh, how God Almighty is just doing a great work in Dubai. Amen. God willing, we'll be in Australia this year, laboring and working. Belgium is hollering. Belgium want this message down there. We got a beautiful size work now in the Netherlands. Folks just coming, Come. want to be baptized in Spain, throughout so many parts of Germany. Amen. Germans going down in water. Coming out the water, speaking in tongue. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God that the Spirit of God give utterance. Amen. You just can't stop what God is doing. And I want to say to you preachers that are hollering, please holler louder. <laughs> and I want to say to you folks that follow these preachers, give them some water yeah. to help them holler louder. And understand this, you will never be able to stop the truth of God. That's right. Amen.
dear Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your presence on this new day, recognizing your infinite grace and boundless love that sustains us through every challenge and uncertainty. As we gather in spirit, we bring before you the hearts of those who wake up today burdened with a heavy heart, feeling devoid of motivation, experiencing the weight of loneliness and on the brink of giving up. Lord, we know that you are our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in times of trouble. Psalm 46, 1. We lift up these weary souls to you, knowing that your power is made perfect in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Father, in this moment of prayer, we ask that you would envelop these precious souls in your comforting embrace. Let them feel your love, which surpasses all understanding. Philippians 4, 7. Let it wash over them like a gentle stream, refreshing and reviving their spirits. Strengthen them, O Lord, and renew their hope as they embark on this new day. We pray for those who lack motivation, Father. Your word tells us in Proverbs 16, 3, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and He will establish your plans. We ask you to infuse them with a renewed sense of purpose and determination. Grant them the wisdom and strength to commit their endeavors into your hands, knowing that with you, all things are possible. Matthew 19, 26. Lord, for those who feel alone, we ask that you remind them of your promise in Psalm 34. 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Let them sense your presence surrounding them like a warm, comforting blanket. Send them companionship and support, Father, whether through friends, family, or new connections, so they may know that they are not alone on this journey. For those who contemplate giving up, we beseech you, Father, to be their strength. Remind them of the truth in Isaiah 40, 1, 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will help you with my righteous right hand. Encourage them to cast their burdens upon you, for you will sustain them. Psalm 55, 22. May your word be a beacon of hope to all those who are struggling, and may your Holy Spirit fill their hearts with a renewed sense of purpose and an unshakable faith in your goodness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming before you in prayer. We trust in your unfailing love and the promises of your word. As these individuals begin their day, let them rise up with a newfound sense of purpose, motivation, and a deep awareness of your presence. May they walk in the knowledge that you are their strength, their hope, and their ever-present help. We humbly gather in your presence today, united by our shared humanity and our need for your grace and guidance. You, who are the ever-present source of wisdom, strength, and compassion, we come before you with open hearts, seeking solace, clarity, and hope in these challenging times. In the midst of the trials and tribulations that life often brings, we ask for your divine presence to fill our hearts and minds. Grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Help us to find peace in the midst of chaos and to anchor ourselves in your unchanging love. We lift up those who are burdened with heavy hearts today, those who are battling illness, grieving the loss of loved ones, facing financial hardship, or feeling the weight of loneliness and despair. May they feel your comforting embrace, knowing that you are the ultimate source of healing and restoration. We ask for physical, emotional, and spiritual healing for all those in need, and we trust in your divine plan. We pray for our world, which is often plagued by division, conflict, and injustice. Inspire us to be instruments of peace, to stand up for what is right, and to work tirelessly for justice and equality. Help us to recognize the humanity in every person, regardless of their background, beliefs, or circumstances, and to extend a hand of friendship and understanding to all. We give thanks for the gift of life itself, for the beauty of creation that surrounds us, and for the countless blessings you bestow upon us each day. Help us to cultivate a spirit of gratitude and to see your hand at work in every aspect of our lives. Lord, we ask for your guidance in our decisions, your strength in our trials, and your love in our relationships. May we be filled with the fruits of your spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Enable us to live out these virtues in our daily lives, becoming beacons of hope and love to those we encounter. As we journey through life, grant us the wisdom to discern our purpose and the courage to follow the path you have set before us. May we use our talents and gifts to serve others and bring glory to your name. In times of doubt and uncertainty, remind us of your unwavering presence. When we stumble and fall, lift us up with your grace and forgiveness. And when we find ourselves lost in the darkness, be our guiding light, leading us safely home to you. We offer this prayer with hearts full of gratitude and hope, trusting in your infinite love and wisdom. In your holy and precious name, we pray. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today, I stand before you to deliver a sermon that touches the depths of our souls and reminds us of the immense love and grace bestowed upon us by our Heavenly Father. Let us bow our heads in prayer as we seek guidance and wisdom from the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly acknowledging our unworthiness and our need for your divine presence. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to receive your word today. May it penetrate our souls, transforming us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. As we gather in this sacred place, we are reminded of the significance of community and fellowship in our Christian journey. The early disciples of Jesus understood the importance of gathering together, sharing in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Acts 2 verse 42 tells us, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In these simple acts, they found strength, encouragement, and unity. In the fast-paced world we live in today, it is easy to become isolated and disconnected from one another. We often find ourselves caught up in the busyness of life, neglecting the very relationships that God has ordained for our growth and edification. But let us not forget that we are called to be a community of believers, a family that supports and uplifts one another. It is within the context of community that we experience the true essence of Christ's teachings. We learn to love and forgive one another, to bear each other's burdens, and to rejoice in each other's victories. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, reminds us of our responsibility towards one another. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. The beauty of Christian fellowship lies in its diversity. We come from different walks of life, with varying experiences, gifts, and talents. Yet, we are united in our common faith and love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of us has a unique role to play within the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 12 states, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ, our many, they form one body. As we embrace the diversity within our community, we must also cultivate an environment of love, acceptance, and understanding. Our words and actions should reflect the heart of Christ, who welcomed the outcast, healed the broken, and embraced the marginalized. Jesus taught us to love our neighbors as ourselves, showing no partiality or discrimination. Let's follow in his footsteps, extending a hand of compassion and grace to all who cross our path. Yet, my dear brothers and sisters, our call to community extends beyond the confines of our church walls. We are called to be the light of the world, shining brightly in a world filled with darkness. We are called to be salt, bringing flavor and preserving the goodness of God's creation. Our impact on the world should not be limited to Sundays or midweek gatherings, but should permeate every aspect of our lives. In a world that often glorifies self-centeredness and individualism, our commitment to community becomes a powerful testimony to the transforming power of Christ. When we love one another as Christ has loved us, the world takes notice. John 13 verse 30 John 13 verse 35 reminds us of this truth. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. May we never underestimate the power of our unity and the significance of our actions. Together, we can make a difference in the lives of those around us, bringing hope to the hopeless, comfort to the hopeless, comfort to the grieving, and healing to the brokenhearted. As we live out our faith in community, let us remember the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, verse 4-5. For just as each of us has one body with many members, 
and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. My dear friends, let us leave this place today with a renewed commitment to community and fellowship. Let us embrace the beauty of diversity and extend the love of Christ to those around us. May our lives be a living testament to the power of community and the transformative work of God. And may we always remember that we are not alone on this journey, for Christ himself promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you all. My dear congregation, today I come before you to address a topic that is of utmost importance in our spiritual journey. The negativity of pride. Pride is a dangerous and destructive characteristic that can subtly creep into our hearts, poisoning our relationships, hindering our growth, and ultimately distancing us from the very source of our joy and fulfillment, God himself. Pride, at its core, is a self-centered attitude that exalts oneself above others. It is an inflated sense of self-importance that blinds us to our own faults and weaknesses while magnifying the faults of others. Proverbs 16 verse 18 warns us, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall. Pride separates us from the humility that God desires in our lives, and it hinders our ability to receive His grace and guidance. When we examine the scriptures, we see numerous examples of individuals who allowed pride to consume their hearts and lead them astray. One such example is found in the story of King Nebuchadnezzar the proud ruler of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's reign was marked by great accomplishments and power, but his pride led him to believe that his success was solely due to his own abilities. In Daniel 4 verse 30, we read of his boastful declaration, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence, by my mighty power, and for the glory of my majesty? However, God was not pleased with Nebuchadnezzar's pride. He humbled the king by stripping him of his power and sanity, causing him to live like an animal until he recognized his need for God's authority and sovereignty. Through this humbling experience, Nebuchadnezzar came to acknowledge that God is the ultimate source of all power and authority. In verse 37, he declares, Now I, a Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. Nebuchadnezzar's story serves as a powerful reminder of the destructive nature of pride. When we become consumed by our own accomplishments, talents, or possessions, we lose sight of the truth that everything we have is a gift from God. James 4 verse 6 reminds us, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. We must humbly recognize that all our abilities, achievements, and blessings come from God's gracious hand. Furthermore, Pride not only distances us from God, but also damages our relationships with others. A prideful person is often self-focused, seeking personal gain at the expense of others. Proverbs 13 verse 10 tells us pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. When we allow pride to control our interactions, we become unwilling to listen to the perspectives and opinions of others. We disregard their feelings and needs, leading to conflicts and division. Moreover, pride hinders our ability to acknowledge and learn from our mistakes. A prideful person finds it difficult to admit when they are wrong, leading to a stubborn and unyielding attitude attitude. Proverbs 16 verse 5 warns the Lord detests all the proud of heart. But be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. We must remember that true growth and wisdom come from a humble heart that is open to correction and willing to learn from its shortcomings and willing to learn from its shortcomings. To combat the negativity of pride, we must cultivate the virtue of humility. Humility is not about self-deprecation or thinking less of ourselves. Rather, it is a right understanding of who we are in light of God's greatness. Philippians 2 verse 3 to 4 encourages us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the other. Humility allows us to recognize our dependence on God and acknowledge that our true worth and identity are found in Him. 
It enables us to extend grace, forgiveness, and understanding to those around us, fostering healthy and meaningful relationships. As we humble ourselves before God and others, we invite His presence and guidance into our lives, experiencing the abundant blessings that come from walking in His ways. Let us, therefore, examine our hearts today and ask God to reveal any areas of pride that may have taken root. May we surrender our prideful tendencies to Him and embrace the virtue of humility. As we do so, let us remember the words of Proverbs 22 verse 4, Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. May God grant us the wisdom, strength, and grace to cultivate humility in our lives. And may we be a community that embodies the love and humility of Christ, bringing light and hope to a world in desperate need. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you all. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today, I want to address a matter that has become increasingly prevalent in our society, the tendency of people to put money before God. In a world driven by materialism, consumerism, and the pursuit of wealth, it is crucial for us as believers to examine our priorities and ensure that God holds the rightful place in our hearts and lives. The love of money is not a new phenomenon. In fact, the scriptures have long warned us about the dangers associated with wealth and the desire for riches. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10 states, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. This verse reminds us that when money becomes our primary focus, it can lead us astray and cause us to lose sight of what truly matters our relationship with God and our pursuit of His kingdom. In our modern society, it is easy to become ensnared by the allure of material possessions and financial success. We are bombarded with messages that equate wealth with happiness, fulfillment, and security. The pursuit of money has become a driving force for many, leading them to compromise their values, neglect their spiritual lives, and sacrifice their relationships in the name of financial gain. When we place money before God, we inadvertently make it our God. Our priorities become skewed and our decisions are guided by the pursuit of wealth rather than by the principles of God's word. Jesus himself warned us about the dangers of serving two masters when he said in Matthew 6 verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Moreover, when money becomes our primary focus, it can lead to a host of negative consequences. We may find ourselves trapped in a never-ending cycle of greed, always wanting more and never finding satisfaction. The quest for wealth can also lead to unethical behavior as we compromise our integrity and values in pursuit of financial gain. Proverbs 15 verse 27 warns, The greedy bring ruin to their households, but the one who hates bribes will live. In addition to the personal toll, the love of money can also have a detrimental impact on our relationships with others. When we prioritize money above all else, we may neglect our families, friends, and communities, failing to invest time, care, and resources into nurturing these essential connections. Our relationships suffer, and we miss out on the joy and fulfillment that come from meaningful human connections. But how can we ensure that we do not fall into the trap of putting money before God? The answer lies in cultivating a proper perspective on wealth and possessions. We must recognize that everything we have is a gift from God and that we are merely stewards of His resources. Psalm 24 verse 1 reminds us, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world, and all who live in it. When we view our wealth as a blessing rather than a means of self-gratification, our perspective shifts. We can use our resources to further God's kingdom, to bless others, and to meet the needs of those less fortunate. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 to 19 encourages us, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. 
As followers of Christ, we are called to be good stewards of the resources God has entrusted to us. This involves using our wealth wisely, generously, and with a kingdom mindset. It means aligning our financial decisions with God's principles and seeking His guidance in matters of money. It also means recognizing that true wealth is not measured by material possessions but by our relationship with God and the impact we make on the lives of others. Let us, therefore, examine our hearts and evaluate our priorities. Are we placing money before God? Are we allowing the pursuit of wealth to overshadow our pursuit of a deep and meaningful relationship with our Heavenly Father? Let us seek His wisdom and guidance, and may our financial decisions be guided by His principles rather than the world's standards. May we remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 6 verse 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. When we prioritize God above all else, He promises to provide for our needs and to bless us beyond measure. As we navigate the complexities of our financial lives, may we always keep our hearts and minds focused on what truly matters. Our relationship with God, our commitment to His kingdom, and our love for one another. May our pursuit of money never overshadow our pursuit of a deeper, more intimate walk with our Heavenly Father. May the Holy Spirit empower us to be faithful stewards, using our resources for God's glory and the betterment of others. And may we always remember that true wealth and fulfillment are found in Christ alone. May God bless you abundantly as you align your priorities with His and seek to honor Him in all areas of your life. In the precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you all. As a Christian, it is essential to recognize and understand the different characteristics of Satan, our spiritual adversary, by discerning his tactics, deception, and ultimate defeat, we can equip ourselves with knowledge and spiritual discernment to stand firm in our faith. In this video, we will explore the deceptive nature of Satan and how we can guard against his schemes. 1. Deception Satan is the ultimate deceiver. In John 8.44, Jesus describes him as the father of lies. Satan distorts truth manipulates circumstances, and plants seeds of doubt in order to lead people astray from God's truth. He often disguises himself as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11.14, presenting appealing alternatives to God's commands and sowing confusion. 2. Temptation Satan is relentless in his efforts to tempt and entice believers to sin. In Matthew 4, 1-11, we see Satan attempting to tempt Jesus himself. He appeals to our desires, weaknesses, and vulnerabilities, enticing us to turn away from God's will. Satan often uses worldly pleasures, power, and pride to seduce individuals and lead them astray. 3. Accusation Satan is the accuser who seeks to condemn and discourage believers. Revelation 12.10 portrays him as the accuser of the brethren, constantly reminding us of our past sins and shortcomings. His goal is to make us doubt God's forgiveness, question our worthiness, and hinder our spiritual growth. 4. Division Satan thrives on creating division and strife. He seeks to sow discord, bitterness, and unforgiveness among believers, churches, and communities. By fostering conflicts and spreading seeds of discord, he weakens our collective witness and disrupts the unity and love that should characterize the body of Christ. 5. Destruction Satan's ultimate aim is to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10 10. He seeks to undermine God's plans, attack our faith, and rob us of the abundant life found in Christ. Satan uses spiritual strongholds, addictions, and oppression to keep people in bondage, hindering them from experiencing the freedom and victory found in Jesus. It is crucial for believers to be aware of these characteristics and the tactics of our spiritual adversary. However, we must not dwell solely on Satan's power and influence. The good news is that through Jesus Christ, we have the victory over Satan. Colossians 2.15 declares that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. As Christians, we are called to resist Satan's schemes by putting on the whole armor of God, Ephesians 6, 11 to 18. 
This includes engaging in prayer, studying God's Word, surrounding ourselves with fellow believers, and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. By cultivating a deep relationship with God and remaining vigilant, we can recognize and resist the deceptive tactics of the enemy. In conclusion, Recognizing the different characteristics of Satan is vital for believers. By understanding his deception, temptation, accusation, division, and destructive nature, we can guard ourselves against his scheme. However, we must always remember that Jesus Christ has secured our victory over Satan through his death and resurrection. Let us stand firm in our faith, rooted in God's word, and equipped with the armor of God as we overcome the enemy and experience the abundant life found in Christ. As a Christian, it is vital to delve into the multifaceted nature of God, recognizing and embracing the various characteristics that define our divine Creator. While we may struggle to fully comprehend the infinite complexities of God, we can explore and appreciate the different aspects of His character that are revealed to us in Scripture. In this video, we will embark on a journey to better understand the diverse attributes of God. 1. God's Holiness Scripture repeatedly emphasizes the holiness of God. In Isaiah 6.3, the prophet declares, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. God's holiness signifies His complete separation from sin and His perfect moral purity. It serves as a reminder of His absolute perfection and demands reverence and awe. 2. God's Love One of the most renowned characteristics of God is His boundless love. John 3.16 beautifully expresses this truth, stating, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. God's love is selfless, unconditional, and sacrificial. It is the very essence of His nature extending to all humanity. 3. God's Justice God's justice ensures that righteousness prevails and evil is held accountable. He is a just God who cannot tolerate sin and injustice. Psalm 89.14 declares, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. God's justice demonstrates His commitment to upholding what is right and fair. 4. God's Mercy Alongside His justice, God also extends His abundant mercy to humanity. Lamentations 3, 22-23 reminds us, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. God's mercy offers forgiveness, grace, and second chances even when we fall short. 5. God's Wisdom God's wisdom surpasses human understanding. Romans 11.33 exclaims, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. His wisdom guides His actions, plans, and purposes, surpassing our limited perspectives. We can trust in His wisdom even in times of confusion or uncertainty. 6. God's Faithfulness Throughout Scripture, we see God's unwavering faithfulness to His people. Deuteronomy 7.9 declares, Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping His covenant of love to a thousand generations. God's faithfulness ensures that His promises endure forever, providing us with hope and assurance. 7. God's Sovereignty God's sovereignty encompasses His absolute authority and control over all things. Psalm 103.19 states, The Lord has established His throne in heaven and His kingdom rules over all. God's sovereignty reassures us that nothing happens outside His knowledge or control, even when circumstances seem chaotic. These are just a few glimpses into the diverse characteristics of our multifaceted God. While these attributes may appear distinct, they are perfectly integrated within His divine nature. As we deepen our understanding of these characteristics, we can develop a fuller appreciation of who God is and cultivate a more intimate relationship with Him. Ultimately, it is important to recognize that God's characteristics are not mutually exclusive, but work harmoniously to reveal His glory and express His love for us. As we explore and embrace the various attributes of God, our faith is enriched, our worship is deepened, and our lives are transformed. In conclusion, the multifaceted nature of God allows us to recognize and appreciate the diverse characteristics that define our divine Creator. 
From His holiness and love to His justice and mercy, each attribute provides us with a unique glimpse into the depth of God's character. May we continue to explore, embrace, and worship the multifaceted nature of our loving and sovereign God, allowing His attributes to shape our lives and draw us closer to Him. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today I stand before you as a humble servant of the Lord, entrusted with the task of delivering a message that resonates with the depths of your souls. As we gather in this sacred place, let us open our hearts and minds to receive the Word of God, for it is through His divine grace that we find solace, strength, and guidance in our journey of faith. In this ever-changing world filled with turmoil and uncertainty, it is essential for us to ground ourselves firmly in the unchanging truth of God's Word. The Bible, our Holy Scripture, is not merely a collection of ancient stories, but a living testament to God's eternal love and unwavering presence in our lives. It is a source of wisdom, inspiration, and hope that stands the test of time. As we reflect upon the current state of the world, we cannot ignore the challenges we face. The storms of life rage around us, threatening to engulf us in fear, doubt, and despair. Yet, in the midst of these tempests, we must remember that God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in times of trouble. He is the anchor that holds us steady amidst the crashing waves, providing us with the courage and resilience to weather any storm that comes our way. In times like these, it is natural for us to question, to seek answers, and to find meaning in the midst of chaos. It is in these moments of uncertainty that our faith is tested, and it is through these trials that we grow and mature in our walk with the Lord. Remember, my friends, that faith is not the absence of doubt, but rather the courage to believe and trust in God even when everything around us seems bleak. In the book of Psalms, we find solace in the words of King David, a man after God's own heart. He cried out to the Lord in times of distress, pouring out his emotions and finding comfort in the divine presence. Likewise, we too can turn to God, pouring out our hearts before him, knowing that he hears our cries and will never abandon us. The Lord is our shepherd, guiding us through the darkest valleys and leading us beside still waters. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus spoke of the greatest commandment to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. These words, my dear brothers and sisters, are not mere suggestions but the very essence of our faith. We are called to be the hands and feet of Christ, extending love, compassion, and grace to those around us. In a world that often thrives on division and hatred, we are called to be agents of unity, peace, and reconciliation. Let us not forget the parable of the Good Samaritan, a powerful reminder of our responsibility to care for those in need. The wounded traveler lay by the wayside, ignored and neglected by the religious leaders of the time. But it was the Samaritan, the outsider, who showed compassion and mercy, tending to his wound and providing for his needs. Through this parable, Jesus challenges us to break down the barriers that divide us and to embrace our shared humanity. As followers of Christ, we are called to be a light in the darkness, shining the love of God into every corner of our lives. This means standing up against injustice, fighting for the rights of the oppressed, and advocating for the marginalized. It means extending forgiveness to those who have wronged us, even when it seems impossible. It means embodying the teachings of Jesus, loving our enemies, and praying for those who persecute us. In our journey of faith, we are not alone. We are part of a community, the body of Christ, called to support and encourage one another. Let us be mindful of those around us who may be struggling, offering a helping hand, a listening ear, and a word of encouragement. May our churches be places of refuge and healing, where broken hearts find solace, weary souls find rest, and wandering spirits find a home. In conclusion, my dear brothers and sisters, let us go forth from this place with renewed strength and conviction. Let us face the challenges of this world with unwavering faith, knowing that our God goes before us, behind us, and beside us, and beside us. May we be the living embodiment of Christ's love, grace, and mercy to all whom we encounter. And may our lives be a living testimony to the transformative power of the gospel.
May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. My dear brothers and sisters, today, as we gather in this sacred place, I am filled with both gratitude and awe. Gratitude for the opportunity to stand before you, to share the word of God, and to witness the love and faith that reside within this congregation. All because despite the challenges and trials we face in our lives, we are here together seeking solace, strength, and spiritual nourishment. In the world we live in today, it is easy to become overwhelmed by the noise and distractions that surround us. We are bombarded with information, opinions, and demands, leaving little room for introspection and connection with the divine. Yet, it is precisely in these moments of stillness, when we quiet our minds and open our hearts, that we can hear God's voice speaking to us. The theme that has been weighing heavily on my heart recently is that of grace. Grace, my friends, is the unmerited favor bestowed upon us by a loving God. It is a gift freely given regardless of our flaws, mistakes, or shortcomings. Grace is the balm that heals our wounded souls and the light that guides us through the darkest night. Let us reflect for a moment on our own lives. How often do we find ourselves striving for perfection, chasing after success, and constantly measuring our worth based on external standards? We live in a world that often values achievement over character, appearances over authenticity, and possessions over relationships. But in God's eyes, none of these external markers matter. What truly matters is the state of our hearts and the love we show to one another. Grace is the antidote to the pressure and expectations we face. It reminds us that we are human, and as humans, we are fallible. We make mistakes, we stumble, and we sometimes lose our way. But it is through grace that we find the courage to rise again, to learn from our failures and to extend forgiveness to ourselves and others. Grace liberates us from the chains of guilt and shame, allowing us to embrace our imperfections and grow into the people God has called us to be my dear friends, as we journey through life, let us not forget the power of grace. Let us extend grace to ourselves and others, recognizing that we are all on this pilgrimage together. In a world filled with judgment and condemnation, let us be the bearers of grace, offering a sanctuary where others can find solace and acceptance. Grace also calls us to action. It compels us to reach out to those who are marginalized, oppressed, and forgotten. It implores us to stand up against injustice, to advocate for the voiceless, and to be agents of change in a broken world. Let us not be complacent in the face of suffering, but rather fueled by grace. Let us become the hands and feet of Christ, bringing hope and healing to those in need. But we must also remember that grace is not a license to remain stagnant in our spiritual journey. It is an invitation to transformation to allow God's grace to mold and shape us into vessels of love and compassion. It requires us to examine our hearts, to seek forgiveness for our shortcomings, and to actively pursue a life of righteousness and integrity. As we conclude our time together today, let us carry the message of grace with us. May it infuse our every thought, word, and action. May it be a constant reminder that we are loved beyond measure and that we are called to love one another with that same extravagant grace. My dear brothers and sisters, let us go forth from this place, renewed and inspired by the power of grace. Let us be beacons of light in a world that so desperately needs it. And let us never forget that, in the embrace of grace, we find the true meaning of life and the abundant blessings that come from a relationship with our loving Creator. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The narrative of the call of Abraham, found in the book of Genesis, marks a crucial juncture in biblical history as God chooses an ordinary man to become the patriarch of a chosen nation, a covenant people. The narrative unfolds in Genesis 12, where God calls Abram, later renamed Abraham, to embark on a transformative journey, setting the stage for the formation of the nation of Israel and influencing the broader Abrahamic faith traditions. Three, the story begins with God instructing Abram to leave his homeland, his kindred, and his father's house to journey to a land that God would show him. The divine call is characterized by profound promise a God pledges to make Abram into a great nation, to bless him, and to make his name great. 
Furthermore, God promises that through Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The call encompasses both personal and universal dimensions, foreshadowing the role of Abram in shaping the destiny of humanity. Abram responds to God's call with unwavering faith and obedience. At the age of 75, he takes his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all their possessions, embarking on a journey toward the land of Canaan. See, the narrative emphasizes Abram's trust in God's promises and his willingness to follow divine guidance. Upon reaching Canaan, God appears to Abram and reaffirms the promise of the land to his descendants. Abram faces a test of faith as a famine strikes the land of Canaan. Instead of relying on God's promise, Abram and Sarai journey to Egypt. Fearing for his life, Abram instructs Sarai to conceal their marital relationship, leading to a series of events that involve deception and endangerment. God intervenes to protect Sarai, illustrating divine providence even in the face of human shortcomings. As Abram and Lot, both blessed with abundant possessions, face conflicts among their herdsmen, Abram demonstrates humility and a desire for peace. He offers Lot the choice of the land, and Lot chooses the fertile plain of the Jordan, leaving Abram with the land of Canaan. God reaffirms the promise of the land to Abram and expands on the scope of his descendants, emphasizing the vastness of the inheritance. Abram's faithfulness to God is tested again as he becomes involved in a regional conflict. Lot, dwelling in the city of Sodom, is captured in a military campaign, prompting Abram to mobilize a force of 318 trained men to rescue him. In a remarkable victory, Abram rescues Lot and secures the return of the captured possessions. Following the victory, Abram encounters Melchizedek, the priest king of Salem, who blesses Abram, underscoring the divine favor upon him. Grai iterates the promise to Abram in a visionary encounter. Abram, concerned about his lack of descendants, receives assurance from God that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars. In a ritualistic covenant ceremony, God reaffirms the land promise and establishes the covenant through the symbolic act of cutting animals in two. The covenant is sealed, signifying the solemn commitment to fulfill the promises made to Abram. Faced with the barrenness of Sarai and the apparent delay in fulfilling God's promise, Sarai suggests that Abram take her Egyptian maidservant, Hagar, as a concubine to bear children. This act of human initiative leads to the birth of Ishmael. However, the narrative anticipates the complexities that will arise from this decision, as the tension between Sarai and Hagar foreshadows the challenges within Abram's household. It appears to Abram once again, reaffirming the covenant and changing Abram's name to Abraham, signifying his role as the father of many nations. God institutes the covenant of circumcision as a visible sign of this covenant. Sarai's name is also changed to Sarah, and God promises that she will bear a son, Isaac, through whom the covenant will be established. The narrative reaches a climactic point as God tests Abraham's faith through a seemingly unthinkable command. The sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham, demonstrating unwavering faith, prepares to obey, but at the last moment, God intervenes, providing a ram as a substitute sacrifice. This episode underscores the depth of Abraham's trust in God and foreshadows the concept of substitutionary sacrifice that will resonate through later biblical narratives. The narrative transitions to the death of Sarah. Marking the end of a significant era, Abraham, grieving the loss of his wife, seeks a burial site, negotiating with the Hittites for the cave of Machpelah. The purchase of this burial site becomes a symbolic act, solidifying Abraham's connection to the land promised by God. Abraham, now advanced in age, commissions his servant to find a suitable wife for Isaac from among his relatives. The servant, following a divine sign, encounters Rebekah at the well and brings her back to Canaan. The story introduces Rebekah as a key figure in the unfolding narrative, continuing the legacy of the covenant. Abraham's narrative reaches its conclusion with his death at the age of 175. His sons Isaac and Ishmael bury him in the cave of Machpelah. The narrative then briefly traces the generations of Ishmael, fulfilling God's promise to make him a great nation. The focus, however, shifts to the continuation of the covenant line through Isaac. Some narrative transitions to Isaac, the son of Abraham, facing similar challenges as his father. Isaac, dwelling in Gerar, experiences God's guidance and protection. 
God reaffirms the covenant with Isaac, emphasizing the promises made to Abraham. The narrative highlights the continuity of the covenant through the generations. In conclusion, the call of Abraham spanning multiple chapters in the book of Genesis unfolds as a rich tapestry of faith, obedience, and divine promises. Abraham, chosen by God to be the father of a multitude, navigates a journey marked by trials, tests, and triumphs. The narrative not only shapes the destiny of the chosen people, but also contributes to the theological and ethical foundations of the Abrahamic faith traditions. Abraham's unwavering faith, the establishment of the covenant, and the anticipation of future generations resonate through the biblical narrative, leaving an indelible mark on the history of faith and redemption. As a Christian, it is crucial to delve into the history and character of Satan, our spiritual adversary. By understanding the origins, tactics, and ultimate defeat of the enemy, we can equip ourselves with knowledge and discernment to stand strong in our faith and resist his schemes. In this video, we will explore the biblical perspective on the history and character of Satan. The origins of Satan can be traced back to his initial creation as an angelic being. In Ezekiel 28, 12-17 and Isaiah 14, 12-15, we gain insights into his beginnings and subsequent fall. Satan, originally known as Lucifer, was created as a beautiful and powerful angel. However, pride and rebellion welled up in his heart, leading him to desire to exalt himself above God. As a result, he was cast out of heaven, along with a third of the angels who had joined him in his rebellion. Satan is depicted in the Bible as the deceiver and accuser. In John 8.44, Jesus refers to him as the father of lies who seeks to deceive and manipulate humanity. Satan's primary objective is to lead people away from God and undermine his plans and purposes. He employs various tactics, such as temptation, doubt, and distortion of truth, in his relentless efforts to turn individuals away from the path of righteousness. Throughout history, we witness Satan's character through his interactions with humanity. In the Garden of Eden, he cunningly deceived Adam and Eve, enticing them to disobey God's command and introducing sin into the world. Satan's aim is to separate humanity from God, keeping them in bondage to sin and estranged from the abundant life found in Christ. Despite his power and influence, we find hope in the truth that Satan's ultimate defeat has been secured through Jesus Christ. Colossians 2, 15 affirms that Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities, making a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. Through his death and resurrection, Jesus broke the power of sin and defeated the works of the devil. As believers, we have the assurance that Satan's ultimate destiny is eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 10. However, we must remain vigilant as Satan continues to wage spiritual warfare against believers. Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 encourages us to put on the full armor of God to stand against the enemy's scheme. By cultivating a deep relationship with God, immersing ourselves in His Word, and relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, we can resist the devil and experience victory over his temptations and attacks. As Christians, we are called to be discerning, vigilant, and prayerful in our approach to spiritual warfare. We should not underestimate the enemy's tactics, but rather be aware of his strategies to deceive, discourage, and divide. By keeping our focus on Christ and relying on His strength, we can confidently navigate the challenges posed by Satan and emerge victorious. In conclusion, the history and character of Satan reveal him as a fallen angel who seeks to deceive and undermine God's plans. As believers, we must equip ourselves with biblical knowledge and discernment to recognize his tactics and resist his schemes. However, our hope lies in the victory secured by Jesus Christ through His death and resurrection. Let us stand firm in our faith, relying on God's strength and the spiritual armor He provides as we overcome the enemy and experience the abundant life found in Christ. As a Christian, it is essential to shed light on the deceptive tactics employed by Satan, the enemy of our souls. One of his strategies is to take symbols that have positive and sacred meanings, such as shapes, rainbows, and pyramids, and distort them, turning them into negative associations. 
In this article, we will explore how Satan seeks to manipulate the meaning of these symbols and how we can reclaim their true significance in light of God's Word. Symbols hold great power in human culture. They can convey deep meaning, evoke emotions, and serve as visual representations of abstract concepts. God, in His infinite wisdom, has used symbols throughout history to communicate His divine truths and promises to humanity. However, Satan, the father of lies, seeks to pervert and corrupt these symbols for his nefarious purposes. He cunningly takes symbols that hold positive meanings and distorts them, attaching negative connotations to deceive and confuse people. By doing so, he aims to undermine God's truth and lead individuals away from the path of righteousness. One symbol that Satan has distorted is the rainbow. In Genesis 9 verses 13 to 16, God established the rainbow as a sign of his covenant with humanity, promising never to flood the earth again. The rainbow represents God's faithfulness, love, and mercy. However, in recent times, the rainbow has been co-opted and associated with ideologies and movements that promote behaviors contrary to God's design for human relationships and sexuality. Satan has successfully manipulated this beautiful symbol to further his agenda, causing confusion and leading people astray. Another symbol that Satan has perverted is the pyramid. In biblical history, the pyramid shape was associated with the construction of monumental structures, such as the pyramids of Egypt, which served as tombs for ancient kings. However, in modern times, the pyramid has been used in various occult practices and conspiracy theories, linking it to secret societies and hidden agendas. Satan has exploited this symbol to foster fear and perpetuate false narratives, diverting attention from the true foundations of faith in God. Shapes, such as triangles and pentagrams, have also been subject to distortion. The triangle, which can symbolize the stability of God's love, has been twisted into occult symbols, representing demonic forces. Similarly, the pentagram, which historically had positive associations with the five wounds of Christ or the five senses, has been corrupted as a symbol of dark magic and witchcraft. As Christians, we must be vigilant and discerning, recognizing these tactics employed by the enemy. We must not allow Satan to redefine the meaning of sacred symbols and distort our understanding of God's truth. Instead, we can reclaim these symbols by studying and embracing their original biblical significance Moreover, it is crucial to rely on the guidance of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's Word. The Bible is our ultimate source of wisdom and discernment. It reveals God's intentions and purposes for symbols, offering a solid foundation to navigate the intricate world of symbolism. In conclusion, Satan's attempt to distort symbols that have positive meanings is a cunning strategy to lead people astray and undermine the truths of God. As believers, we must be aware of these tactics and rely on biblical wisdom to discern the true meaning behind symbols. Let us reclaim these symbols, understanding their intended significance according to God's Word, and use them as reminders of His faithfulness, love, and redemption. By doing so, we can expose Satan's counterfeit and stand firm in the truth of Christ